I don't know if any of you were in Barcelona in the workshop, but some of you may remember that Jönse publicly called me out. Um, he was saying that uh, we should have published NVDLA with the RISC-V first, and we, uh, were, we announced the uh, ARM first, so Jönse never called me out publicly again. <laughs> Anyway, uh, we did take that to heart and we uh, combined uh, the uh, NVDLA with RISC-V. Of course, uh, um, being a big RISC-V supporter, uh, that was uh, my favorite uh, processor to work with, of course. <laughs> um, so what is uh, the, the NVDLA is a deep learning accelerator that we developed originally for our Xavier SOC, which is a uh, was announced like last year or so. It's uh, used for um, automotive applications and uh, also for things like uh, uh, video analysis. Um, so the, 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 the NVDLA does a lot of division processing in that uh, case, right? For example, if you, you're used to this uh, Tesla, you can see that it uh, knows where other cars are, right? It does that by looking at the cameras, right? That kind of functionality is uh, basically done by the NVDLA. Um, so we decided to make this uh, unit publicly available for, uh, for, for everybody. Uh, we felt that, it's, uh, that there's a lot of different uh, IPs already out there that do similar things. We didn't feel that it was for us something that we um, felt very strongly about that that was like a competitive advantage for us. At the same time, we feel it was something that would help other people to develop, especially edge devices that would be intelligent, right? So uh, they would be uh, developing uh, IoT devices, any kind of, you know, you can use it for many, many different things. Um, drones, your doorbell, uh, all kind of things. And for, for NVIDIA, that was a way to uh, encourage people to use more deep learning, which in the end is good for us because we do, for example, the training as well. And uh, we cannot own every single edge device in the world anyway. So uh, having that, that out there and encouraging the field in general was something that we felt was also in NVIDIA's interest. If you look at the NVDLA, it's, uh, I, I can't really go into the details, but, but just not enough time for that. But it's, it's, a, it's a very simple architecture. There's a big buffer, a convolutional buffer, and there is a large multiply accumulator array. Um, and, and Xavier, we have like uh, 4,096 max, uh, two DLAs, two, 2,048 each. Um, so, uh, and then there's post-processing, which does, does a number of non-linear functions. Uh, some, also some kind of uh, pooling, which basically kind of makes the, the matrices smaller. Uh, and, and all of that sits in between a, a logic, a control block, and a memory interface. Right, so that's how it looks. Um, as you can see, there's also two different... Uh, uh, memory interfaces there. There's an uh, SD RAM interface and there's an on-chip RAM interface. Uh, in general, those these type of applications take a lot of uh, memory bandwidth, specifically, also big memories. And um, reducing memory bandwidth was, is important in some cases, so that's why we allow two different memory interfaces, uh, one going to on-chip memory. You don't have to have that, so that's the other thing. So um, we, of course, developed our own design, 2048 max, but uh, we knew that it had to be parameterized for other uh, use cases, uh, specifically uh, made smaller. So, um, for many applications, you can do a lot less than 2048 max. Uh, for example, a doorbell, right? You wouldn't have to do high definition frames. You don't need to do a frame frame rate of 60 frames per second, right? If you look three times per second, if there's somebody at the door, that's probably good enough, right? It's, uh, um, so so we, we made it much more uh, parameterized, okay? So that's, that's kind of how the 
architecture look. So we have two configurations. Talking about this param parameterization, we have a small and a large configuration. The small configuration only supports 8-bit uh, integers. The large configuration also has the 16-bit data types for both integer and floating point. Um, small configuration only has an one memory interface typically used for SD RAM, although you could use it, of course, for uh, internal RAM as well. The large configuration has two. And then there is a number of other configurations like a weight compression uh, that's only part of the larger configuration. It's, a, it's, it's fairly, I, I present it as if there's two discrete parts, but in reality there's, there's a lot of choices you can make and it, it becomes a very flexible uh, architecture. And um, I'm, I'm showing some examples of what uh, it could look like. So for small configuration, uh, we could use 512 max, uh, two, 256 kilobytes, and that would be about 1.4 square millimeter in a 60 nanometer process. It would be able to do 93 frames per second of uh, ResNet 50 um, and, and, and 100 milliwatts, which power is, uh, of course, extremely important in this type of uh, IoT applications that we're uh, targeting. Uh, on the bigger side, right, we could have uh, 1024 8 bit integers combined with uh, uh, max combined with 512 16 bit, bit uh, max. Uh, again, 256 kilobytes seems to be a good uh, number of, a good size for the buffer. Um, that would give 2.4 square millimeters, uh, 230 frames per second, so more than twice the performance of the smaller one. Um, again, the, the power under half a watt, so uh, still doable for quite a few devices. Uh, on the software side, um, the idea is that you use any kind of uh, standard deep learning uh, model, like a cafe model, could be a TensorFlow model, um, and uh, you, you have your uh, compiler, uh, parameters that basically specifies, for example, how many Macs you have, how much buffering you have, right? And then the at compile time, you would you would pass the network and optimize it for the uh, specific version of DLA that you have. Not all of this is 100% open source yet, but it's going to be open open sourced. Uh, we we we're just still working on some of it, but uh, the, the this is coming up. Um, then on the runtime side. You would uh, you, you actually compile or create something that we call a loadable. That would be uh, loaded in by the application and the user mode driver, uh, user and kernel mode driver to the DLA and be executed on DLA. Uh, so the, all of this software is available or will be available. Uh, it's, it's mostly compiler that we're still doing the last tweaks to make it uh, more parameterized than we have it for our own internal use cases. What you can do with this is, uh, for example, an example over here is recognizing different objects. This is showing uh, YOLO version three, um, which is an open source network. So even the network is uh, freely available. And uh, then you can put all of that stuff and put it into the Sci-Fi Freedom Unleashed platform. And that's what Jönsup is gonna talk about. That's pretty cool. So by now, you're thinking about using all this technology for your own custom application. So maybe you're thinking about a smart camera with MVDLA in it. So maybe you're thinking about like a smart voice device with MVDLA in it. Or maybe it's your own idea that you like to accelerate with MVDLA. But maybe you're two guys in a garage not having access to tools. Maybe you're a seed-funded startup worrying about how am I going to get the PCI interface because that itself is a couple of million dollars. Maybe you work at a large company, you have great ideas, but your idea will never get funded. So what do you do? Well, I'm here to tell you that you're covered. <laughs> so at Sci-5, we've been building this product called Chip Designer. So this is a SaaS product 
You log in to the website. If you just have a laptop and internet, you just log in. You pick a chip template, and you can drag and drop new IP. So as a matter of fact, on the left-hand side, you can see MVDLA is already onboarded. You just pick that, drag it onto your chip. Maybe you have a couple different IPs that you're developing in-house. You just drag that in. And then you hit review, and you click a couple more buttons, and, and you're good. So as a matter of fact, at Sci-5, we've been integrating all these layers together to provide this service. So Sci-5 provides a design layer, and it's running on something like Amazon Azure, and all the EDA tools that you need to go build the chip is already onboarded onto the cloud. All the IPs you need to fill in the rest of your chip is fulfilled by DesignShare IP. Sci-5 takes care of the fab relationship with TSMC and Samsung, and we own the OSET as well. So we give you tested package parts. Let's dive into the Sci-Fi Freedom chip platforms. Today we have two platforms as a good starting point. We have Freedom Everywhere platform, which is a low-cost 32-bit microcontroller platform. We also have Freedom Unleashed, which is a high-performance 64-bit multi-core platform. So the way it works is these platforms are vetted by Sci-Fi. We actually tape out these reference platforms. It demonstrates the silicon capability of each platform, and we support the board support package as well, so all the software is good to go. It reduces risk for you, and we can prove out our design flow. And once that's ready, you go and pick that, and you customize. So you can add or remove design share IP. You can customize the CPU IP that's inside the platform. You can also add your own IP, like accelerators, coprocessors, and other IPs. And once you're done, we can handle the rest. Prototype a couple hundred chips. If you're interested in going to production, you know, your, your chip is a wild success. You just call us and say, we need a million parts. We will ship you tested package parts. So just to give you an example, this is the Freedom Unleashed platform that we taped out. It's a 64-bit quad-core RISC-5 Linux platform at the heart. There's a 1.5 gigahertz Q54MC IP. As a matter of fact, today, the microchip announcement was this uh, quad-core IP. There's a bunch of low-speed peripherals and high-speed peripherals, like ChipLink. This is something that Martin talked about this morning. It's exporting the internal SOC interconnect called TyLink outside to the chip. And there's also a gigabit Ethernet connection outside the chip. So what you can do with this chip link connection is you connect it to an FPGA. You deserialize it back to TyLink. So as if your SOC fabric was connected out to the FPGA, you can start dropping your favorite accelerators into the FPGA. So we also put together a board. And the board is called Hi5 Unleashed. It has the chip that I just talked to you about, and 8 gigabytes of DDR4 gigabit Ethernet port, and an SD card, and, and all the other goodies. So you connect this with the MicroSemi Polifier expansion board, and you have a pretty good prototyping system. In the middle, there's the MicroSemi Polifier FPGA. There's the PCI connection to the PCI switch. And on the board, there's a by 16 and by one PCI slot. So you can put graphics cards, USB cards, and all that. And you can just prototype with Linux software. You can also connect the Hi5 Unleashed with the Xilinx VCU 118 evaluation board. This is, a, this is a photo of it. This FPGA has two PCI root complexes, so you can kind of see two PCI cards hanging off on the side. So the Freedom Development Kit also comes with all the software that you need. So Hi5 Unleashed supports Linux, so we provide a Linux BSP based on Debian and Fedora. The graph on the left shows you the number of Debian packages ported to RISC-V. You see the hockey stick going up. That's the number of RISC-V packages ported in Debian. And as a matter of fact, we started from 0% early this year. We're at 84%, so thank you very much. The ecosystem took care of all that. So on the right, you can see Fedora running on the High 5 Unleashed board as well. So with standard Linux software, you just go and get do app get install packages. You can get the web browser, and the web browser can run JavaScript. And this is, as a matter of fact, Google Maps, just running on the RISC-V platform. 
So you can have a normal USB camera, multi-programming all works. There's Twitter, there's Tuxcart running in the back, and you know, multi-programming workloads work just fine. So with this package, ingredients, you can put together a demo system. So MVDLA is in the form of RTL, so you just map that onto the FPGA. You connect that with the High 5 Unleashed. In this particular case, we use a small configuration with 2K max and 512 kilobyte memory. We, in this particular case, you can, we mapped it onto the Xilinx Evaluation Kit, but you can also map it onto the Polifier Kit too. The MVDLA is running YOLO v3. The Linux operating system is running on High 5 Unleashed. It was super easy to port over the user mode drivers and the kernel mode drivers, which were originally developed for ARM. You just cross-compile it, and since it's a normal development platform, it just all worked out. And also, the demo setup was built with OpenCV. Thanks to Debian packages, you just apt-get install OpenCV, and that's how you write the, the demo program, which captures a frame from the USB camera, sends it to the MVDLA, reads the results back, and put it on, put it on the screen. So this is the results running on RISC V. It just looks exactly the same. As a matter of fact, you can start customizing your freedom chip with MVDLA just today. The open source IP cores lower the bar of implementing your RISC V based products. Thank you, NVIDIA, very much for open sourcing MVDLA. I encourage a lot more companies to go join the open source revolution. Freedom chip platform offers a complete template SOC with software support. And the combined kit is a good starting for point for smart IoT and edge devices. And as a matter of fact, everything is already open source, so you can go check it out right now, and you can contribute yourself. Just go to this GitHub, MVDLA hardware software, and github.com sci-fi freedom and MVDLA blocks to get started today. So go crazy, go try it out, and once you're ready, please come talk to us for your RISC-V AI chip needs. Thank you very much.